start by, by taking a step back for maybe five years. When uh, John Cedar Brown brought out a paper called Minds on Fire that you may have read. And if, like me, you're passionate about the potential of technology to enhance learning, then you might have been heartened by what John said five years ago, where he said that attention has moved from access to information towards access to other people. And remember, this was five years ago, which in terms of technology enhanced learning, was actually quite a long time ago. So at that time, the, the social tool, the social web, was Web 2.0, as, as it was called, it was becoming more prevalent. Uh, we were seeing social media sites, uh, microblogging like Twitter and so on, that was relatively new, but becoming more mainstream. So there was the opportunity for people to come together and uh, not just have dialogue, but actually build knowledge themselves collaboratively on the web. It had been possible before, but it was, it was more seamless, shall we say. The tools were now available. And it's not only the explicit knowledge that people could build online, but they could also build tacit knowledge, or, or things, things that we do all the time, every single keystroke can come together and be analysed through analytics and to help us then do, do things more effectively. And so there was the beginning of this notion of learning analytics. That was five years ago, quite a long time ago. And around about the same time, there was also the first massive open online course. And, uh, the idea for a massive open online course came from discussions that uh, colleagues in the States and Canada were having, so it was Dave Wiley, George Siemens, Stephen Downs, Dave Cornier, and people um, in that group who were discussing this idea of a massive open online course. So what is a massive open online course? The, the basic premise is it's large scale, so massive numbers of people can come in. So it's a bit like a massive open online game, shall we say. And there's also the idea that it's open access, so open to all. There was, amongst that group, the idea that this presented a novel pedagogical approach, and it was based on the idea of connectivism. Can you please put up your hand if you've heard of connectivism? So quite a number of you have. You'll probably know then that connectivism is an idea um, that arose from discussions between George Siemens and Stephen Downs. It's the idea that learning is in the connections that people make. Connections with each other, uh, connections with information or knowledge resources, and that somewhere, it hasn't been really uh, defined exactly where, but somewhere within those connections, while we're having some interaction or dialogue, there is learning as a byproduct. And connectivism has been posited as a theory. Some people would say connectivism isn't a theory, it's an approach. But however we define it, it's an interesting way of thinking about how people learn in networks. And despite all the, the discussions that have been going, going on over the past few years, actually there's very little still known about how people learn in these massive open online courses. One debate which, uh, which arose a couple of years ago tried to define MOOCs, these massive open online courses, as uh, basically being at two ends of the spectrum. So there are what's known as an X MOOC, or people have defined as an X MOOC. And this is um, a pretty structured MOOC. So some of the MOOCs that were designed um, a year or so ago by uh, Coursera and so on, these are MOOCs where People can sign up, they can go into the MOOC, they probably look at uh, podcasts or vidcasts, um, they might have some interaction with other people, but largely they're going through a very structured course, um, quite similar to the early online learning courses. Um, so the, the learning pathways are decided by the instructor and, and there's a definite direction for, for learners to go in. And at the other side of the scale, we have what's known as CMOOCs, 
Uh, these are the connectivist looks. So you can say that the original massive open online courses were these connectivist looks, which actually have very little structure at all. Um, in some of them, learning goals are actually defined by the learners themselves and the learning pathways, like who you connect with, how you connect, what kind of platform you use, is often down to the learner as well. So, despite the fact that we don't actually know very much about how people learn in these massive open online courses, there has been an enormous proliferation of them over the past couple of years. So I did a rough uh, trawl of the web, and I discovered um, under, well, not all of these are ex MOOCs because these are, are ends of the spectrum. But broadly speaking, there are a whole range of uh, companies, organizations like Coursera, for example, edX, which is basically um, a consortium led by Harvard and MIT, and other organizations, FutureLearn, which was announced by um, the Open University earlier this year. So these are all um, organizations that are either setting up, running, or planning to set up MOOCs. So behind each of these names, you can find a whole range of different MOOCs. And on the other hand, there are a lot of um, these connectivist type MOOCs as well. This is only a, a sample, it's not the, an exhaustive list. And you can see it at the, at the top, there's uh, CCK08, which was looking at this idea of, of connectivism and knowledge, and was one of the first MOOCs ever. So, there's a lot of activity. Vice chancellors and pro vice chancellors are going crazy, right? Tell me if your pro vice chancellor has mentioned a MOOC. Right, keep your hand up if your pro vice chancellor is, is positive about MOOCs and wants to run MOOCs. Put your hand up if your pro vice chancellor is very skeptical about MOOCs. Maybe it's only mine. <laughs> <laughs> we are very skeptical about MOOCs. Uh, so there's there's a lot of there's almost a race to, to open up um, access to learning, which is great. But we, we don't really have the empirical evidence as to how people learn in MOOCs and what MOOC design might look like. So if we take a little step back and through, through the literature and think about what we actually do know about massive open online courses, um, one of the first groups to study MOOCs was uh, Finney and colleagues. And they were really looking at the technological aspects of MOOCs. They were looking at the kinds of tools that people were using and so on. And one of the key conclusions that they came to was um, that people need to have pretty good digital literacies um, to be able to learn within a MOOC. And then uh, Jenny McNess and, and colleagues have been doing some uh, really interesting research on the massive open online courses. And one of their conclusions has been that um, Stephen Downs a number of years ago said that critical factors for MOOCs are that learners can be autonomous, that the MOOCs are diverse, that they're open, and that people are connected. Now remember, when we talk about George Siemens, uh, Stephen Downs, and so on, they're thinking about these connectedness MOOCs, so the, the premise of those is that learning is through connections. Um, but there are tensions around having autonomy and having diversity, having openness and having connectedness. So although these are desirable, they actually cause some uh, tensions in terms of learning. Uh, Cop et al. Um, have done a number of different studies and their findings are unearthing some of the critical literacies that are required to learn in MOOCs. Um, it's a quite unique way of learning, um, so we need to know a little bit more about some of the literacies. And then um, myself with um, colleagues, uh, Colin Milligan, Anoush Margarian, and Lou McGill, and others uh, within the Caledonia Canyon group, we've been carrying out a number of different studies. Uh, some of these have been on massive open online courses, and others have been uh, learning in open environments. And in particular, we're interested in how the learner self-regulates the learning. And that's of particular interest to me because in higher education, there's a bit of a tension between providing structure for the learner. So we've, we, we have uh, masses more 
learners coming into campus-based universities. We provide a lot of support and structure for those learners. Um, we think very much about the learning experience and, and how we can support people. But somehow that might mitigate against helping students to be able to develop the kinds of skills, competencies and mindsets they need for learning in the open. So we have to be aware of that. So, here for me is a grand challenge for, for all of us, that every university graduate in the UK and indeed worldwide should be able to have the abilities, the confidence and the literacies to set their own learning pathways and achieve their individual learning goals. That's almost the opposite of the direction that higher education has been going in for the past few years. Um, a couple of years ago, I uh, carried out a scoping study with colleagues uh, Karen Stefanian, who's now at uh, Warwick University, and Anush Markarian, who's in the Caledonian Academy group. And uh, we were working with the Higher Education Academy, looking at uh, some of the literature that there being sustainable approaches to e-learning. Because obviously, the idea of a massive open online course um, from an altruistic point of view, we're opening up education for all. But from a, if, if I could be a little bit cynical, from an institutional point of view, from a vice chancellor's point of view or a pro vice chancellor's point of view, maybe there's a way of making sure that this is sustainable, affordable, scalable, and economic as well. So we did a scoping of um, the literature in sustainable e learning. And here are some of the broad trends that we found. That the, the literature as it is tends to focus on the education sector. It doesn't really think, it doesn't really think about the wider societal trends. So that's quite limiting in a way. There are often examples of doing things online um, or, or taking something that, that people do face to face and putting it online. Um, and that involves a lot of structuring for the learner rather than looking at how learners can map out their own learning pathways. Often the literature looks at these bounded structured environments like vir virtual learning environments or learning within a classroom or a particular group rather than open as the norm. And we found that content is often the, the, the centre of activity. So um, learning objects from 10 years ago or um, some reusable resources more recently, um, open educational resources, rather than the idea of, of people being central as well. So we don't see this move from thinking about content to thinking about people. So bearing in mind um, those trends, here are four questions. It's not the first question asked twice. <laughs> it's four different questions that I thought would be interesting to think about this grand challenge. So how do learners or how might learners open in these, uh, learn in these open unstructured environments? What kind of learning approaches might be useful? Um, and who and what might structure learning? So first question, how do people learn in open unstructured environments? We don't really know very much about MOOCs, but one of the places where people have been learning in very open, unstructured environments for decades is in industry. So I want to tell you a little bit about a study that we did um, a few years ago with Shell Learning. And there we were looking at how experts were using the Shell Global Knowledge Sharing Networks for learning. Now these were people in a variety of different areas, so some of them were finance and procurement specialists, some of them were uh, process chemists, some of them were geophysicists. And they couldn't really learn by going on a course because they were working at the boundaries of knowledge in their field. So typically they had to find uh, a new method of, of uh, finance and procurement or some new way of, of drilling. So they really have to learn in these open and structured environments and build new knowledge for themselves. So we carried out a, a, a study uh, a few years ago 
and we developed a, a use case of how someone within Shell using the Global Knowledge Network, using an unstructured environment, would typically learn. So imagine that you're a process chemist working for Shell. You will set your goal, your learning goal, so I want to develop a new coolant for drilling, and that goal is likely to be aligned to what your work goal is. When you're carrying out that learning goal, you'll draw from a whole range of different resources. So these could be formal learning resources, some notes that you make, uh, it could be blogs or tweets, it could be uh, recommended resources from other people. You'll also draw on a whole range of different people, so it could be someone in your team, someone in your group, your tutor, your mentor, it could be people within the organisation or outside the organisation. You'll work as an individual, but you'll also work within a group, within a network, which is less tightly uh, bound together, and within a collective. And you might not even know that you're working within a collective. For example, all the activities that you carry out while you're learning, some of those activities are analysed and feed back into the system. So those tacit pieces of knowledge that you're adding about what you do is fed back into the collective. So we're working in all these different ways. It's almost like parallel universes. We're doing all of this at the same time. And while we're doing it, we're connecting with resources, connecting with people. We're consuming or using those resources, uh, using the knowledge that we find. And while we use that knowledge, we are also creating knowledge. So some of you might be tweeting just now, creating some new knowledge that could be reused later. And we're contributing that back to the collective. So these are the four knowledge actions, shall we say, broad actions that people carry out while they're learning in these unstructured learning environments. And it's not only an individual who's learning, but we discovered that there could be other people who have similar learning goals that you could connect up with if you only knew where they were and what it was you were trying to learn. And we discovered this through our shell study. There were lots of people across the company who were learning, who, who were trying to learn and follow broadly similar learning pathways, but they didn't know that there were other people who were doing something similar. So um, to summarise, um, when we have the, all the collective knowledge out there on the web, in this case it was the, the shell global knowledge network, which was bounded. We have all the knowledge out there on the web. Then to use that knowledge and to learn from that knowledge, people tend to connect. They tend to consume the knowledge. They will create the knowledge and contribute it back to the collective. So if we think about the sorts of learning approaches that people use um, while they're learning it in this kind of way and while they're learning in a MOOC, um, Spard, uh, more than a decade ago, 15 years ago now, uh, did a, a survey of approaches to learning um, in non-formal education and broadly categorised it as learning ranges from the acquisition of knowledge, so that could be uh, summed up in higher education terms by lecture tutorial type model or online learning where you, you uh, download some, uh, some resources and you read those resources. So that was at one end of the scale. At the other end of the scale, there were more participatory <coughs> modes of learning. Uh, and then a few years ago, uh, colleagues in Finland, uh, Pamela and Hakarainen, came up with the, the idea of knowledge creation. And this was related to, to learning in a network. So when we learn in a network and we actually create knowledge, then we have a, a third paradigm for learning, shall we say, which is about knowledge creation and releasing knowledge. So if we think about the 
before um, the four different actions of uh, connecting, consuming, creating, and contributing knowledge, learning acquisition really focuses on people connecting with different resources, whether they're articles, podcasts, um, any kind of knowledge resource, and consuming or using those resources. So if we think about this in terms of um, open educational resources or MOOCs, then typically if, if I want to learn, I don't know, how to design a MOOC, I might search online, find an open educational resource or some open courseware that helps me to do that. And I consume or use that. That would be an acquisition type model. Um, and in terms of MOOCs, these X-type MOOCs, highly structured MOOCs, are uh, support acquisition learning. So, typical example from, from a MOOC, here's um, an example from the web where you look at <coughs> a video cast, a podcast of um, how, to, how to do some uh, mathematics, and then there, you go through the, the structure here, so step-by-step -step approach, and then at the end you might have an online test, for example. There could be some interaction with other students, but although there are massive numbers of students doing the course, the interaction might be minimal. So the acquisition model typically sequence tasks and um, little or no interaction with other people. So although the course is open, we're not really using the power of, of the many, the massive part of the massive open online course. Now, the participatory model involves not only consuming and connecting, but also creating resources that can then be contributed back. So if I give you an example of that, um, in terms of online learning, there are lots of examples of blended learning, where students might work together, either face-to-face -face or online. Uh, they might contribute knowledge and share that knowledge. And also in these connectivist type MOOCs, where um, I'll give you an example. Uh, this is uh, FONA, which is from the University of Coventry. It's an online course in and this is a, an excellent example of uh, participatory learning. Now, in this massive open online course, uh, students can, can sign up for the photography course. Um, they can have a mentor who's a professional photographer. They create their own online portfolio. And there's a lot of intera interaction. They, they genuinely form a community within this class. Um, so this is a, a great example of how people are creating knowledge and contributing that back. They're not just creating photos and, and contributing them to their portfolios, but there's a lot of knowledge behind those photographs about how they create the photos um, and, and what they might do with them. So typically, although the structure of the course might be provided by the instructor, there is a lot of personalization by the learner, and um, learners provide this community peer support, um, and they create and contribute content. Now we have the third paradigm for learning that I mentioned earlier, which is knowledge creation. And um, in some ways, Fornar goes into this, this idea of knowledge creation. But really, with the third paradigm for learning, we're going even further. And this is real personalization of learning, um, like the example I gave earlier from Shell, where learners themselves can actually set their own learning goals and their learning pathways. And examples from higher education are uh, maybe research degrees, if you do a project in your master's or, or you do um, a doctorate, and also professional or workplace learning, uh, like the example earlier. So a key element of learning through knowledge creation is that the learner maps out or charts his or her own learning pathway. So the learner decides, this is my learning goal, and could possibly learn with other people if they have a similar learning goal. 
and that that learner, when the learner is um, carving out their learning history <coughs> and moving in the direction of their learning goal, that they create their own resources which can be contributed to the collector. I'm going to say a little bit more about charting later and how we might help people if they want to chart. So, what I'd like to do is just to pause for thought for a little while and to ask you this question because there's a lot of controversy over massive open online courses. Some people think this is really important, can't wait to, to run a MOOC, it's opening up education, it's scalable. Some people think, well, okay, this is the next fad for e-learning, it's not going to last. So I'd like you to take just a few minutes to think about maybe at each table. Do you think that MOOCs will be a mainstream approach to learning in universities? And you have some multiple choice answers here. So it could be no, definitely not. It could be mm, not mainstream, but you know, there's some place for MOOCs, or it could be yes. All right, so what I want to do over the next 10 minutes is, is to tell you a little bit about some uh, research we've been carrying out. Can you uh, touch this one, please? One pack. Just to uh, distribute these. Um, I'm distributing a paper which is under review at the moment, second stage of review, for a jolt and special issue on massive open online courses. Um, and also I'm preparing a book on uh, reusing open resources, which is a follow-up to reusing online resources that was published 10 years ago. Um, this book is being edited by myself and, and Chris Pegler, a colleague from the Open University. Um, and uh, you can see the, the book that someone has just won uh, in preparing for blended e-learning. Uh, Rutledge is, is advertising a new book as a follow-up to this. So, there are a number of publications on, on the way. So the paper that's being distributed just now um, is looking at learners' ability to self-regulate in massive open online courses. And so a lot of the issues that, that you mentioned about your own experience of being a learner in a massive open online course or uh, whether or not you think it's, it's possible for mainstream higher education um, came out as part of this study. So um, our hypothesis for this study was that people who have a high degree of self-regulation can, can regulate their learning will use qualitatively different strategies to plan, monitor and reflect on their learning in a massive open online course. And uh, we did a qualitative study um, last year on the Change of Living MOOC, which was a C-type <coughs> MOOC uh, led by... George Siemens, Stephen Downs, and Dave Cornier. We used a mixed method um, where we had a survey where we could measure, measure people's ability to self-regulate. This is based on some work by uh, Barry Zimmerman and colleagues in New York, uh, where he has various measures of self-regulation, um, which we, we used a, an instrument that he had used in formal education and adapted that and then we followed it up with some interviews. And here's what we, here's what we tried to do. We, we looked at the four knowledge actions that I mentioned to you earlier that we found through the, the Shell study, where people consume, connect, create, and contribute um, uh, knowledge. And we mapped that against, uh, Barry Zimmerman has uh, three phases of self-regulation. So there's the forethought phase where people plan what they're going to learn, the performance phase where they actually carry out their learning, and then the self-reflection phase where people self-reflect on their learning. Now in formal learning, these phases are usually sequential, but in non-formal learning, and, and possibly in MOOCs as well, these phases are perhaps all happening at the same time. So we don't necessarily just plan goals and then reflect on them later, we might plan and reflect and carry out some learning at the same time. So uh, what we did with the data that we collected was we mapped the actions that people carried out. So how did they actually consume knowledge, connect with other people as they were planning their learning in the forethought phase? Um, how did they uh, 
create new knowledge when they were actually performing their learning goals and so on. So we came out with these rich pictures of what people actually do. Now remember, we, we interviewed 29 people and we had their self-regulated learning score, which gives some kind of measure of um, how they would self-regulate their learning. And against that, we also looked at the kinds of tools that people were using. So uh, what did they use to, to consume knowledge? Uh, what did they use to connect with knowledge? Uh, what kind of uh, software were they using? Obviously, this depends a little bit on the environment, the course that they're on, and the change of the MOOC. But you know, roughly, what kind of tools were people using uh, to, to learn in the MOOC? And so you can see, I don't expect to be able to read all this, but I just want to illustrate. We can build up quite a rich picture of what people are actually doing in the, the in this case, a connectivist MOOC, and how they're consuming, connecting, creating, and contributing knowledge while they're planning their learning. So um, to distill all that down, we discovered that there were three broad groups of learners within the Change of Living MOOC. So there were some active learners, we called them, and these are people who are fairly good at self-regulating their own learning. They set good goals and they structure their own learning. There was also a, a group of passive learners who basically expected to be taught. They wanted someone else to, to structure the learning for them. And then there was another group, quite significant group, who were what we called the lurkers. Actually, they called themselves the lurkers. One of the interesting um, aspects of each of these groups was that we discovered the active group had a very good internal network. By internal, we mean within the group of people who had signed up for this course. There were 2, 000, over 2,000 people had signed up for the change of living MOOC, um, but we discovered there was only probably just over 300 who were active throughout the MOOC. If you look at um, the, the lurkers, you can see that their networks that they, they work with, so that the people that, that they say they're learning with, are internal within the MOOC, primarily external, or they don't have any MOOC. So, so lurkers are kind of kind of distributed. They don't just um, rely on this internal network within the MOOC to learn. And the passive um, participants are the opposite. They basically didn't really form any networks within the MOOC. So that's quite significant in terms of, of their learning. So that was one of the key um, factors that we found differed across each of these groups. Now, I wanted to give you some, some quotes from um, people with, within the group, what the kinds of things they were saying to us about the way that they were uh, behaving within the Change of Living MOOC. So of the active participants, 12 out of the 29, they were very conscious of making connections with other people. They were very active, and some people were saying there are people everywhere. Some people are so active within the MOOC, I don't know how they have time to do it. They seem to have the, the skills, the competencies, the confidence, the abilities to make these connections and to be able to, to reach out and connect to other people, either through their own postings um, or through prompting other people to have some responses. Now the workers, um, there were a fair number, a significant number of, of people who called themselves workers within the course, or of the people that we interviewed. And what they said was basically, well, we're not actively contributing to the change of living group. We're not necessarily blogging or tweeting, but we're still learning, and we're taking something from the course. So that was quite significant. And you can see here from these quotes that they recognize the fact that they are lurking. And then the final group, the passive participants, four out of the 29 people 
that we interviewed. Now, people were self-selecting for interviews, so it doesn't mean that these proportions are throughout the, the, uh, the number of participants. It could be that fewer passive participants agreed to be interviewed. But these people were really not very um, happy with, with the, the whole structure of the MOOC. They didn't like learning in the MOOC. Um, in some cases, they didn't feel they had the confidence to put their ideas out to be criticised by others. Um, so, although the, the lurkers are not contributing, but on the whole they seem to be learning, the passive participants are, are not really having a very satisfactory experience at all. So, one of the factors that really influenced how people behaved within the MOOC was whether or not they had been in a, a MOOC before. And you can see that of the active participants, a lot of them actually had experience of learning in a MOOC. So there's a question, is it possible to learn how to learn in these rather unstructured MOOCs? And in fact, of the active participants, a lot of them had learned in more structured MOOCs. So they had gained that first experience of being in a MOOC uh, in a more structured way. But we also found confidence was, was a key, in, this is one of um, Zimmerman's uh, sub-factors of self-regulated learning, is self-efficacy, the ability to determine uh, what you know relative to, to um, the goals that you have, but also confidence. Um, so people don't have the confidence to actually put their knowledge out there they're unlikely to, to get back and to be able to learn from the MOOC. And motivation, what were people's reasons for signing up to the MOOC? A lot of people said that they signed up to the Change of Living MOOC because they themselves were wanted to run a MOOC, not run a mock, run a MOOC. Um, or uh, to understand the pedagogy, or uh, a lot of people were, uh, this is part of their profession. They were perhaps doing a doctorate in technology enhanced learning, or they are a learning professional. So some people simply wanted to look at them and see how, how it operates, how people learn in it. Other people did want to learn, did want to connect with others, so that had a, a lot of influence over what people actually did as well. So our hypothesis, did we manage to confirm or, or not? Um, we did find that people with high self-regulated learning scores tend towards being active. So we have we have a list of the scores, and we have a list of, of um, whether people are active or passive or lurkers, and the active people tend to be at the top. The lurkers are interspersed throughout that list, and uh, the passive learners are definitely towards the bottom of the self-regulated learning scores. But we. We, our sample size is too small, we can't actually say, it's not statistically valid that we can say that people who uh, score well on a self-regulated learning score are going to be active learners because there are lots of other factors. But at least this gives us some insight into people who have the confidence, uh, motivation and ability to set their own goals and uh, can learn better in a so we're still looking at the, the data for, for each person and, and getting quite a rich picture of what it can look like to learn in a connectivist group. But one of the questions that we have been asking for a number of years uh, when we've been looking at learning, not just in MOOCs but in unstructured environments, is is there a way of helping people to be able to structure their learning? And earlier I mentioned if, if learners actually set their own learning goals, is there a way that we can connect people through those learning goals? So people are no longer just connecting through, um, I don't know, resources that they find or, or being on a course, but they, they connect through the learning goals that they set. And so uh, we've been doing research for a number of years now, looking at how can learners find others with similar goals, um, even if those people are not in the same course as they're in, or if they are in the same course as well. And um, one of the ways that we've, we've been experimenting with is a system called charting. And charting is basically, it's a, a tool that can help people to self-regulate their learning. We're actually going to, to launch the charting tool set with
with the Higher Education Academy next month. Um, and the Higher Education Academy group on interdisciplinary learning is going to be using this tool. So um, charting is actually available um, as an open source uh, tool set. And uh, I'll explain to you a little bit about how it works. So it uses the idea of a goal as a social object to help connect people together. So in the charting tool set, I'll give the URL uh, how you can download it. Um, I can actually articulate my goals. So what is my learning goal? What is it I want to learn? Then if I find resources on the web that help me learn that goal, so if my goal is how to design a MOOC and I find resources out there that help me to design a MOOC, I can tag those resources and link them to my goal. And then um, I can basically develop a whole collection of different resources that help me learn that goal. So essentially I'm bringing together the knowledge which helps me to learn um, a particular goal. But other people can do the same. And I can browse and search for other people's learning goals to find other other people who have similar learning goals to me. Or actually, is someone else's learning goal interesting to me so I can adopt it? So the charting tool set works a little bit like, um, put your hand up if you use social bookmarking like Delicious or something. So it works a little bit like social bookmarking where I put out my goal, I tag it to a number of resources and other people can browse my goals or my resources and they can adopt my goals and resources. So the charting tool set is open source, it's lightweight, it's meant to be used alongside the tools that a learner would use in a personalised tool set uh, and it's available from the, the URL there which is uh, charting.gcu.ec.uk. So at the moment we're still analysing data, we're still thinking about learning in MOOCs. Uh, we have another study uh, where we're looking at how people, how culture, a learner's culture actually changes as they, as they work in a, in a MOOC. And we're looking at uh, some discourse analysis. So we've got lots more to learn about MOOCs. So if I go back to our original questions, we know a little bit more about learning in open unstructured network environments. Um, we as universities have to think much more about the approaches that people might use and what the future might be in terms of MOOCs. But um, I really